So thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. <clears throat> My name is Corey Harris. I'm the Watershed Services Coordinator at the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. Um, Ryan, uh, Ryan Good, our water resources engineer, is here as well tonight. Um, so I, I'm recording this online because there's a couple of people visiting us from home. Um, that's why we've been focused on the technical stuff uh, the last little bit. But I'm going to kick things off and, and walk through about 20, 22 slides just to give an overview of what this project's about, some of the work we've done and, and how this information is going to be used um, in the future. If, if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to project a little better. <clears throat> So some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight, uh, just give a bit of background on why there was a need for this study, give an overview of what LIDAR is and touch on what our survey program involved. We're gonna talk about some of the different inputs that went into our hydrologic and hydraulic models to produce the mapping. Talk a bit about model results, um, touch on our, our web map viewer, and then um, wrap up with the timelines that are that are coming up in the next uh, month or so. So, can you guys hear me? Okay, all good. All right. So, the background for this study: Why did we want to do this work? And really, it's uh, the main reason is just the vintage of this previous version of the mapping. Uh, this mapping was done in 1977. And it was good work for, for the time that it was completed, but we don't have digital versions of these models at all. I have a couple of boxes of punch cards in the attic at our office for this model. Um, and the limitations for that is when you want to um, make a change with parts of the model or, or test what a new culvert's gonna do in a certain area, you can't do that if you don't have a digital working version of, of the model for the floodplain. A lot of stuff's changed since 1977. Uh, a lot of structures have been replaced and upgraded. Um, there's been some growth since, since 77, as well as uh, just the, the use of GIS. Um, those are services that we didn't really have back in 77. I think GIS was being formulated and talked about but the technology wasn't there. Uh, additionally, we've got um, the, the use of LIDAR, light detection and ranging, and that's a new tool that's come out, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, but that's been a game changer for floodplain mapping. Um, we've got a lot of GIS information, like land use, um, soils information, channel information, a lot of that has been now incorporated uh, into this new model. And also the mapping is really gonna help us prepare with emergency preparedness planning, uh, as well as flood prevention and mitigation. So just to give you a sense of what the 1977 maps look like, um, this, is, this is what, what they showed. So you can see the dark lines along the creek are the estimates of the floodplain. The dots are cross-section locations where um, the, the geometry of the valley and the floodplain were coded into the original punch card model. And you can get an elevation in feet above sea level at each, at each dot or each cross-section. When you zoom in, it looks like this. So this is just the village of, of Lester on the 1977 mapping. <clears throat> Another main driver for uh, doing this project is that the province has made it very clear in their flooding strategy that priority number one is understanding flood risks. And it's hard to do that when you have a punch card model and you can't change it. <laughs> So we had to recreate these models digitally from, from scratch um, so we can model different changes within the watershed. So the project area, you can see 
that includes Wilmot Creek on the, on the west side, Graham Creek on the east, and you'll see Foster Creek at the bottom has been grayed out. The reason for that is there have been some mapping updates done in the last decade uh, for Foster Creek. I think the main branch was done in 2015, 2016, and the, the two trips on the northeast part of Foster were done in 2019. So we, we do have plans to um, pull those, those models together and release that mapping in the future. Um, what you do currently have, if you're in the Foster Creek watershed, we do currently have um, mapping in hard copy that, that we can make available uh, for you. But the updating of Foster was beyond the scope of this particular project. We were focused on Wilmot and Graham. <clears throat> So some of you may have heard the term LIDAR, it's being used a lot. Um, it stands for light detecting and ranging. And it, it really has been a game changer in how, how you look at uh, elevation data in, in Ontario. What it is, is a, a plane flies over uh, a given study area. It will um, use lasers to and pulses of light down to the ground surface and the equipment is very sensitive. It can measure how those lasers reflect back up to the plane. And it, it shoots approximately um, 12 points per square meter. And from that, you can get uh, what's called point cloud data, which can then be used to develop plane surfaces in three dimensions. So it's very, uh, very useful information and it's very accurate. It measures the ground surface high level of, of accuracy. Um, one of the limitations with LIDAR, it doesn't penetrate water. The particular, uh, you know, the, the spectrum or wavelength that's, that's used for, for this, it doesn't penetrate water. So you have to get um, you know, bathymetric data or, or survey data below the water level if you have areas of standing water like uh, reservoirs or, or large uh, creek or river systems. So this data is very, very helpful in figuring out drainage and, and um, drainage patterns. <clears throat> so this is an example of what a LIDAR point cloud looks like. You can see how um, it, it picks up vegetation um, and, and you can also filter that vegetation out to get bare earth surfaces. And that's what we use for, for our information, for our modeling. This, this data is the same, um, the same information that the province uses in the Ag Maps software. So if we have any farmers in the audience, um, it's the same uh, LIDAR data that, that is used in the Ag Maps app. And you can see there is an elevation model uh, layer that you can click on if, if you do use Ag Maps. <clears throat> This is just an image showing um, the elevation data across the study area. One of the things that uh, our team did as part of this work is we spent a lot of time surveying, <laughs> um, a tremendous amount of time. So one of the things that uh, LIDAR doesn't do, it doesn't pick up any information below bridges or, or um, um, you know, structures that span the, the creek systems. So to get that information, we've got to go out and we've got to use survey equipment to pick up that, that elevation data. So this will include things like um, the crest of a road, uh, culvert or bridge uh, dimensions, the elevations of the culvert inlets and outlets, uh, wing wall positions, abutments, channel data. Um, and we also do cross sections upstream and downstream of, of the structure to confirm the capacity, the conveyance capacity of each structure. We also take photos of vegetation so we can estimate uh, roughness numbers. And then we also use all of this data to calculate channel capacities. So <clears throat> when we go out to a, a given section of channel, we'll take six great points to get the uh, the dimension of the channel. That, from that, we can get an area, and then we can calculate um, how that channel performs under different flow conditions. 
So as mentioned, there's a lot of survey. All these dots represent a culvert or a bridge structure that had to be surveyed. And one of the reasons is um, the LIDAR data comes in the new national vertical datum standard, which is it's called CGVD 2013. Um, and so to match that datum, make sure we're all, you know, we're talking apples and apples in terms of elevation and vertical elevation. Um, we had to go out and survey all of these structures in that same datum. If we didn't do that, the previous datum that was used is uh, approximately a foot, maybe half a meter off. And if we're assuming a culvert's half a meter out, that can make a big impact on what gets flooded in a, in a floodplain model. So it was very important to get the survey, the structure data um, as accurate as possible. You may recall why we were asking for property access and really the, the driver behind that was to get the best information possible for uh, a given property. And we ended up having to focus this in on kind of areas where development is clustered. We just didn't have the manpower to do it for the whole study area. Um, but when, when we look at channel capacity, we wanna make sure the channel geometry below that standing water level is, is accurate so that we can confirm depths and widths and, and just overall channel dimensions. So if we don't get that as accurate as possible, sometimes the flood line may end up being a little bit higher than it, it might've been if we had site-specific channel, channel data. It's just a little more conservative. <clears throat> There's a number of guidance documents that that we follow when we do this type of work. Um, we've got a, a provincial guideline from, from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, we also have technical guidelines that the Greater Toronto Area Conservation Authorities uh, use. And we also were having regard for the federal guidelines that came out in, in recent years. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of standards and guidance to, to help us in, in this work. <clears throat> when we're talking about um, developing a hydrology model, and really the hydrology is, is the exercise we're going through to determine uh, based on land use and soils and, and the, the slope of the terrain, how much water is gonna come off a given area for a specific rainfall. Um, this is another area where the LIDAR data really shines because we have really good information on, on the terrain. So we're able to get a much better handle on you know, what a drainage area might be for a given section of creek or what's the slope of that particular reach of creek. And that all affects the, the amount of water that comes down a system as well as the timing of those flows uh, for the overall watershed. So, um, you know, we're looking at things like, uh, like terrain information, as I mentioned, subcatchment drainage areas, soils information, land use. Um, we're also looking at how each subcatchment responds to a, to a rain event. Uh, we're obligated to, to look at both the regional storm, which is the hurricane hazel event for this part of Ontario, as well as the 100 year storm. And, and we have to take the greater of, of the two. Um, some of you may recall Hurricane Hazel. It happened in 1954 over the Humber River. Was anyone around for Hurricane Hazel? Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> but Hurricane Hazel was, was a major disaster for Ontario. And the province basically said, we need to plan for events like that. And we, we take the rainfall that the Humber River got in 1954, and we put it over Graham Creek and we put it over Wilmot. And that's how we use, uh, that's what we use to determine what the impact of, of those events are. And that helps us determine the flow rates that we would use. And those flow rates are in turn put in our hydraulic model. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So the hydraulics are really the geometry of, of the creek and valley system. So we'll, we'll be able to get cross-section information from the, uh, the digital elevation models that we create from the LIDAR. 
combine that with the low flow channel information. And then we start adding bridges and culverts and roads into the model. So once you know what, what your cross section is like and you have a slope, you look at um, the frictional losses from the vegetation and the floodplain, you start putting structures in and then that will tell you based on the size of the opening in that structure, how the water will back up behind it. So we have to do that for all of those structures that we surveyed. That was a big, <laughs> a big task. Um, we would also look at dams and weirs, uh, building obstructions in areas where buildings, legacy developments in the floodplain. And we also set boundary conditions at the downstream end of the model. And I just wanna show you this, this image on the right this side is uh, just an example of what a structure looks like in the model. And this is the 401 bridge for the Ganarasta River um, in Port Hope. So you can see on the left-hand side, you can see the river and the piers. On the right-hand side is the Choke Road underpass um, to the west of the river. So, so we would build a, a model like that for every culvert and bridge that, that's in these uh, areas of interest. So in terms of, of results, um, there's, there's some, some differences in compared to the 1977 work. Uh, there's a few areas where flow has gone up, some areas where it's dropped down, some areas where just our information is showing um, an increase in drainage area compared to the 1977 work. So there's nothing, nothing here that was startling or alarming. I think the biggest, biggest thing is at the bottom end of Wilmont, flow has gone up probably by about half, 64%. So because Wilmont's such a, a deep valley, when you translate that into the hydraulics, there wasn't a big increase in the flood lines because it's contained within the valley. So um, although there's some differences, we, we did go through a calibration and validation exercise. And what that means is we're basically looking at uh, rain events or, or flow events that were reported at stream gauges. We are able to get that data, compare it to rainfall data. So apply those scenarios in the model to see how accurate our model is. And so we looked at three storms for calibration and three storms for validation. And uh, that helps us confirm that, you know, flows are going up at the right times in the given branches. Um, you know, we're, we're getting peak flows that are similar um, that were actually measured. So, so it just gives us a lot more confidence in the model. And they, they didn't have that luxury back in 77. So it just, it just helps validate and give us more confidence in the results that we, we did achieve. Uh, one thing we noticed is at the top end of Wilmont, there's an area in the order of 700 hectares uh, that was missed in the 1977 model. This is kind of around the most port land. Um, so the light green area wasn't included in the original model, so it is now. And so Flows that have gone up a bit in the in the Lesker Trib, that's one of the main reasons why that's occurred is we've got more drainage area, and that was we were able to find that because of the uh, the lighter. Just to give you a sense of what the model looks like, this is a screen a screen <laughs> screen capture out of our our hydraulic model. So you can see the very colorful terrain uh, surface underneath. You can see the, the green and gray structures um, in the middle, that's Highway 401 and then the, the rail line to the south. And that blue line in the center is, is Wilmot Creek. And those brown lines are where we cut cross sections across the terrain to reflect the geometry of the, of the valley system. So uh, you can see in blue, that's, that's the extent of the, the Hurricane Hazel flood line. So just out of curiosity, has, has anyone showed our online viewer? A couple of you? Ryan, I see you have, thank you. <laughs> We're gonna have this up um, 
at least for the next week, maybe week and a half. So if you do have comments, please feel free to, to put them in there. Um, you can add comments. You can see the three buttons at the bottom of the screen. The comment button is the, the third button at the bottom there. So you just click on that, you zoom into a property, you can put a comment in, put your email, and then we'll look into it and we'll get back to you if, if you need. <clears throat> and that's just the, uh, the web address for, for this uh, web viewer. So where do we go from here? Um, like I said, we're gonna receive comments um, up until March 26th. If you have comments after that, we'll still, still uh, hear you out, but just we have to start finalizing, like making our QA, QC corrections and getting our mapping ready for, uh, for production. So if you can get it to us by the 26th, that would be appreciated. Uh, after that, we'll be finalizing the maps and the report. Um, We'll do our reporting to the National Disaster Mitigation Program. They were our, some of our funders. Got to get that done in April. And once that's done, we'll be um, bringing this to our board of directors for endorsement, just as the updated mapping for this creek system. Uh, that's not to say that the mapping will, be, will evolve over time. As bridges and culverts get replaced and as development occurs, we do update the mapping on a regular basis. Um, so now that we have a digital model and not punch cards, we'll be able to do that more frequently and, and just better serve our partners and, and the public. Um, the mapping, once, once endorsed, it will be shared with our municipalities to inform land use and emergency management planning. And we're also going to be um, updating our regulatory mapping that we use for our, our permit application system. So I'll just make sure that that's current and, and up to date. And I, I do need to give a big shout out to our funding partners. Um, you know, the municipality of Clarington, Durham region, uh, they provided mapping or matching funding for our application to the federal government. And then uh, Public Safety Canada matched that, those funding dollars uh, through the NDMP program. So we, we do really appreciate the support. Otherwise this, this wouldn't have happened. So uh, with that, I will wrap it up and I'm happy to answer any questions.